My name is Richard Lovell. I'm an Executive Director at the CFC in the uh, investment and origination business and I'll be moderating your webinar today. So a couple of quick housekeeping notes uh, for everybody on the line. Uh, questions will be answered at the end of the webinar presentation, so by all means um, type those questions into uh, the webinar. Uh, and at the end you'll be redirected to a quick survey um, in relation to the webinar, which we, we'd greatly appreciate um, you filling in for our, for our help. And also we'll email a copy of the webinar later on this week to all people who've registered. So it's my great pleasure to be joined by uh, both Paul Dowling and Dr. Alina Dinney. Uh, Paul's an Associate Director in Investment Research at the CFC and in that role Paul follows developments in latest research on the transition of global energy markets and the deployment of clean tech in order to inform the CFC investment decisions. And he's particularly interested in the speed of that transition and how that's captured in energy market forecasts. Uh, Dr. Alina Dinney, uh, her passion lies in helping consumers and businesses build capacity for the emerging linkages between energy management, mobility and digital engagement. From Sydney to Silicon Valley, Alina has advised a range of organisations on strategic opportunities in the energy and transport sectors, presenting strategic growth opportunities to energy and resource companies across, across the Asia Pacific as a clean technology consultant. Uh, so you've all seen um, the agenda for the webinar, so we might um, jump straight into it with Paul Dowling um, and uh, start working on the slides. Um, you've got the presenters there and I've given you a brief bio on those. A quick question for Paul to kick off. Why, Paul, why has the CSC taken a closer look at the electric vehicles market? Yeah, thanks very much, Richard. Um, so the reason why we're looking at electric vehicles and transport in particular is when we look at the size of the decarbonisation challenge <clears throat> that Australia faces, we see that obviously transport's a large share of Australia's emissions, the, the third largest share at 17%, and about half of those emissions are passenger vehicles. So that's a quite a big share, sort of eight, <clears throat> roughly 8% uh, of Australia's total emissions uh, can be attributed to electric vehicles. And when we look at the other sectors, we've already got in place LRET and policies to decarbonise the, the um, power generation sector. And so when we look at the next sectors to decarbonise, it's clear from a lot of studies that transport uh, is probably the, the next sector that will decarbonise because the technology is known and proven, for, particularly for electric vehicles, but also hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And also the costs of any policy intervention to push that market along have come down significantly in the last couple of years. So when we look at the decarbonisation challenge, we see that um, the, the chance to electrify transport has relatively lower costs than other sectors and pushing uh, a decarbonisation, decarbonising transport now uh, actually takes pressure off of the other sectors which have higher costs to decarbonise, such as industrial process emissions and agriculture. Uh, so what did the CFC do? Well, we partnered with ARENA and we contracted with Energia, who are an uh, um, energy market forecasting specialist, and that, interestingly, Energia also do the EV forecast for AMO. And we asked them to do a report with uh, two focus. The first one was an update to the modelling of the penetration of EVs. And the first point of interest is that the update to this modelling shows a much more rapid and earlier uptake of electric vehicles than other publicly available forecasts in Australia. And so that's interesting because firstly, Energia didn't use a more aggressive model they simply made changes to, it, it's simply the fact that there's been changes to international policy, such as vehicle emission limits and bans on internal combustion engines, and rapid battery cost reductions, and the response by vehicle manufacturers internationally to those changes in the market that has led to an increase in the number of EV models that are planning to, that, are, that will be available in the future. And so this global action on electric vehicles has led to revised upward projections of EVs in Australia. So the international uh, advances are flowing through to the Australian market. Um, so we just want to step through the two graphs on this slide now. The first graph shows the share of EVs, EVs in total sales in Australia and the second one shows the share of EVs in the total fleet. 
And if we start with the with the first graph, and the light blue line is what NRJ has called their no intervention scenario. So that assumes that there's no additional action from uh, Australian policymakers and industry. And that sees an uptake around 2027. So that uptake point is the point where the market moves from a early adopter market through to a mass market. And then moving along that graph, it, the dark blue line there shows a moderate intervention scenario, which assumes a reasonable amount of action by both industry and policymakers in the next couple of years. And um, that leads to a takeoff point happening in 2021, which is six years earlier than the no intervention case. And then finally, the NRJ modeled a accelerated intervention case, which uh, assumes even earlier and more aggressive action by policymakers and industry. And that case has a takeoff point at 2020, and it leads to 100% penetration of EVs in the light duty fleet by 2050. So <clears throat> just to look at those uh, results in detail, the difference between the moderate uh, amount of action required to go from the no intervention case to the uh, moderate intervention case is quite stark. If we select a sort of a midpoint, if we look at 2040, in the no intervention case, there's about 30% of the fleet is electric vehicles, whereas the moderate intervention case has almost doubled at 55% of the fleet being electric vehicles in 2040. So the, sec the second part of the work that we asked NRJ to do was to, to look at a focus on the charging infrastructure required to support those electric vehicles. And this, this, uh, these two graphs here show the number of charge points needed and the investment required in order to support the moderate intervention case of electric vehicle sales. So we know that most people will likely do most of their charging at home, but there's, there will be a need in the future for public charge points to be available for basically three types of users. One is the the user who um, to address range anxiety, so someone who wants to to drive from Sydney to Melbourne, for example, they'll need to be able to to reach, refuel along the way. There'll be uh, around town top ups, so people that are on the road all day will will at some point need to uh, refuel around town. And then for those people who don't have home garages or, or places to charge at work, um, so people that live in units, for example, they'll they'll need to be able to charge on the road. So if we look at these forecasts, um, if you, in the context of infrastructure spend, um, it's a, a surprisingly modest amount of 1.7 billion needed by 2040. And the important thing to note is the bulk of this investment is expected to be made by commercial profit-making charging businesses. Uh, and then the last, uh, interesting finding from the NRJ report I wanted to touch on was the user experience and how that will evolve over time. Um, one of the, the arguments we hear against EVs is that oh, people have to radically change their behaviour uh, in order to own EVs. And so NRJ looked at advances in um, extrapolated battery density and recharge times and they saw that the user experience of being able to arrive at a fast charge point, refuel in three or four minutes, and drive the same distance as a petrol vehicle, uh, this will be able to, to happen by 2024. So in that part of the market in the mid-20s, when we start to see uh, the EV sales move from an early adopter to a mass market uh, point, the user behavior will be exactly identical to an internal combustion engine today. Thanks. Paul, that, that's really interesting um, and, and great findings from NRJ. I, we've actually had a question um, from the audience which uh, is, is in line with the next question I wanted to, to ask you, so that, that's always a good sign. Um, you know, you've spoken about accelerating at EV takeoff um, by six years to 2021. What, what's actually required uh, to make that happen? Yeah, so we, we look again at, at the way that NRJ has done their analysis and their modelling and, and they've identified three barriers that need to be addressed simultaneously in order to move us from that early adopter to the mass market. Um, to the mass market. Uh, those barriers being we need to see upfront cost, the upfront cost premium for an EV that has to reduce. The number of models available in the market have to increase 
and the public charge points have to be available for those people that need to recharge away from home. So the interesting point, we'll dive into each of those three sort of barriers now and how they can be uh, reduced and removed, but the interesting point is that there's, there's policies and levers available at, at local, state and federal government level that can directly or indirectly address all of these barriers. So first we're looking at the upfront cost premium. Um, we, we know that in order to buy an electric vehicle, you, the, the, the equivalent electric vehicle to a petrol car costs more today. And that graph on the right hand side there shows a um, illustrative example of the premium that you have to pay. So the way that NRJ's model works is um, the, the orange line on that graph is the premium that you have to pay in order to own an electric vehicle. And you'll see that that comes down over time as the cost of batteries decrease year on year. Um, and the way that the model calculates the buying decision is that when the upfront cost premium is equal to the benefit that the owner gets from reduced maintenance and reduced fuel costs over two years, which is the red line, once the premium is less than the, than the two-year payback period, that is the point at which um, we start to see takeoff in EV sales. So the, w the way that financial support works, if we look at that graph, is the green line there, that is the equivalent of a $3,000 upfront cost reduction. So if there was policies put in place at either local, state or federal government level that uh, that resulted in an equivalent $3,000 reduction in upfront costs, what that would do is it moves the payback period for the, for the premium forward from 2027 to crossing over the red line at around 2021. Moving along to the second barrier. When we look at the model choice available in the, current, in, in the Australian market, we see that there's, there's around there's five models available at the moment. But if you look at announcements from vehicle manufacturers, there could be up to 20 models available in the coming years. And so we know from discussions with vehicle manufacturers that their decisions about releasing models are dependent on um, how likely they are to sell those models in the market. And, and one of the indicators of that is uh, local, state and federal government policy support. So a uh, supportive policy framework encourages vehicle manufacturers to bring models to Australia sooner. And then the third barrier, <coughs> public charging infrastructure. Um, so we're aware that there's several well advanced EV charging projects underway currently. Um, the Queensland Government is doubling the number of charge points on the superhighway. The NRMA has already unveiled a couple of stations in their 40 odd station regional charging network and uh, it's been reported in the press that there's several private commercial um, charging businesses that are ad uh, quite advanced at the moment as well. Thanks Paul. So, um you know, obviously you've, you've spoken about what policy makers in the industry can do to accelerate the uptake of EVs, you know, by addressing those three barriers. You know, do, do, do you think that an EV future is inevitable? Yeah, so, I mean, I personally do, but also if you look at the leading forecasters of energy markets globally, and this final graph here I wanted to finish on is just to, to, to make the point that over, over the last couple of years, the, the best in the business of forecasting EV uptake have all been increasing their penetration of electric vehicles. Um, so over the last three or four years, the IEA, OPEC, Exxon, BP and Bloomberg New Energy Finance have all seen upward revisions in their EV fleets in both uh, earlier, earlier penetration in the fleets and higher, penetrate, higher percentage of share of EVs over the long term. So. It would seem that if that trend continues of more uh, uh, earlier and, and more aggressive penetration of electric vehicles, that an EV future is seems somewhat inevitable, and it's just a question of timing. Great. Thanks very much for that, Paul. That's um, very helpful. Um, we might move on to um, the slides from uh, Dr. Alina Dini. Um, 
Uh, Alina, I'll I'll kick off um, you know with a question um, you know maybe just to give a bit of background. Yeah, you know, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and and why this topic is is so important to you? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Firstly, thank you very much for having me, Richard and Paul, to talk about this really important topic. Um, I have worked in the electric vehicle industry for 12 years, and I've just put up lots of photos where you'll recognize my face in many of them. And I do that to illustrate the point that one of my career passions, personal passions, and also objectives is to introduce the concept of electric vehicles to everyday people. And so I've committed my time to doing that in person. So there have been a number of examples across the Asia Pacific where I have conducted test drive events or advised governments or helped fleets integrate electric vehicles into their operations. And why that's important as it relates to the work that the CEFC and ARENA have recently done is that we have new products coming into the marketplace very soon, and there is a need for a focus on the personal um, or end-user angle of the equation as well. So that's basically what I'm here to talk about today. Part of um, the situation in Australia for electric vehicles in the past is that the market has had access actually since 2010, but consumer adoption has been very intermittent. So what you can see in the graph pictured, which is real sales data apart from Tesla from 2010 until 2016, is that the variability of uptake is, is a very different trajectory than what we've seen overseas. Sales have been low and buying patterns inconsistent, and we know that su the supply has been unpredictable. And, and the important point here that I'll make is, is actually around consumer confidence and what the buyer or end user experiences in the marketplace. As a researcher, I undertook a project to interview Australian EV buying consumers and better understand what they were experiencing in the marketplace. And I'll admit the time then was quite different than what we anticipate seeing in the next couple of years. But overwhelmingly, consumers expressed barriers that made them hesitate in relation to buying an electric vehicle. And I'll point out the demographic of consumers I sought to interview were those who were very keen on EV. So some of the things they expressed was that they found it really difficult to detect a market presence about electric vehicles. Despite the number of people uh, subscribed to this webinar, there are many, many people in the general public who still don't know what an electric vehicle is. We noted already there was low product diversity in the past, and that's a problem not just for the sake of price point, but also for the sake of meeting the needs of a user in terms of how they drive. So whether it's a family of five or six people that need a people mover, for example, instantly an electric vehicle doesn't fit them. There are few resources available online that people can access, or even in person. So as consumers search for information to help inform their purchase decision through their process, it was difficult for them to inform themselves in a trusted way. And, and by that same token, there were limited options for real-world experience. So being able to see one, touch one, feel one, and drive one was problematic for the users I interviewed. Not many people knew peers or workers, so those water cooler conversations about my new car never really captured EVs, and that was a problem for people thinking about their next car buying process, which, as you would know in Australia, takes place roughly every 10 years. So it is something you do plan for. And most importantly, the sales staff engagement was off base. Um, and what I mean by that is that many of the experiences consumers expressed, except for one brand in particular, was not um, supportive of developing confidence to move forward. And I've listed a quote there from the interview for those who might be interested to read it later. So why things are different now, those are the three products we had in the Australian marketplace before. Um, there are they are no longer available, and, and we do have new, or we do currently have some available for sale for those of you who are so intrigued by this topic that you're going out to buy a new car tomorrow. And as noted by Paul, there are many more coming. So we have an opportunity essentially to reshape the consumer experience in Australia from this point forward, but it does require us as an active industry to pay attention to what the consumer might experience. And when I speak about consumers, I speak about individuals, but also fleets. This graphic requires a little bit of thought, but it's important for me to highlight that Buying an electric vehicle, or any product for that matter, is actually a supply and demand decision. And it's one that we've referred to before in terms of early adopters or mass market. That theoretical framework is based on 
a, a book called The Diffusion of Innovation by Everett Rogers, and essentially what it says is that people will adopt at smaller volumes at first, and then at larger volumes when a product becomes commercially viable or, or viable for the mass market. And what my research revealed, which is depicted here, is that there are a number of, there's a process that consumers undertake before they make a decision to buy an electric vehicle. Um, and that came out of the research that I conducted. And once the consumer has passed through the first two gateways, so they, they're comfortable with the price point, whatever that might be, they're comfortable the product fits their needs, they then have three more gateways to pass through that are influenced by their own unique individual experience before they're comfortable to purchase. Um, you can characterize that as building consumer confidence, but what we do know for electric vehicles is it involves accessing trusted information, having the ability to see the product in real life, and observing its viability in the market. Thanks, Alina. So, um, you know, what th those parties that are keen to um, you know, support that transition to EVs, what, what, what are the things that they can do to be part of that transition? Thanks for asking, Richard. In fact, I've prepared a couple of slides to illustrate five cost-effective actions that businesses, governments, and even everyday consumers can take to become part of this new electric vehicle revolution, which we've identified as coming to Australia very soon. To start, it's really important that you allow yourself to think freely about the future. And I think, as I mentioned, or as was mentioned in my biography, my interest professionally has been in the integration of energy, transport, digital, and an individual, and how these sectors that previously were discrete are now aligning and overlapping in ways that we hadn't imagined before. Um, as an example, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation is now developing transport strategy. So if you as an individual can accept that the motoring paradigm is basically getting completely tipped upside down and you might be able to use electricity that you would get from a PowerPoint at home to fuel your car and travel all the way to Sydney using ultra-fast charging networks, why not? So I would consider that context and think about what your niche would be in that paradigm. And one really great example here which came out of interviews is Tesla. Everyone talks about Tesla in the news, it's hard not to, but what is perhaps not apparent to everyone um, in the marketplace is for electric vehicle car buyers, the Tesla model is incredibly unique because it requires, it does not require you to attend a dealership or to have a negotiation. The transparency and the streamlined approach to buying cars that Tesla have presented has become part of the appeal for consumers. So it's not just about electric motoring, it's about buying cars differently. The second point is around educating yourself. So if you're going to participate in the electric vehicle market as a consumer, you're going to want to understand what it means for you. And that process of educating yourself about electric vehicles and how it fits in your life can take time. But more importantly for a business or an organization such as a council or a state government or a fleet operator that is looking to become part of this really interesting and highly buzzed about topic going forward, it's important to understand that your action is, is very important now. And the figure that I've illustrated here, which is, is borrowed from the ICCT in the US, it represents electric vehicle adoption in California by city. And what you can see based on the colors highlighted is that the blue and yellow represent governments, state and city, and how their actions have impacted electric vehicle sales. But the utility, the green, is also represented. So what you can see from the picture is that essentially it takes a village to participate in normalizing electric vehicles for society. Um, and I've put a couple of pictures of examples of what I would consider to be perhaps slightly farther from normal um, industries that would be participating in the electric vehicle revolution. So McDonald's, um, a number of McDonald's internationally have installed electric vehicle charging to become part of the story. And we've all heard that the NMRA um, announcement from earlier in the call, but what I thought was interesting is in addition to servicing electric vehicles through fast charging stations, the NRMA also has information on electric vehicles on their website to help educate their members. So that's an important contribution. Number three is I think specifically related to governments and that is 
one of the important gateways to accepting electric vehicles is being able to get inside one and appreciate how normal it is to drive and how unique the driving experience is in a pleasurable way. So offering test drives and offering test drives that are extended has been proven to be very, very helpful in normalizing electric vehicles for users. And this diagram here illustrates that the, the greater amount of time an individual spends in an electric vehicle, the more likely they are to, to not only own one, but also to advocate for them. So as an example, a one-year-long trial of the Mini E in Berlin um, resulted in 97% of users after three months saying that they wanted to own an electric vehicle of their own. Number four um, came out of my research but also has been validated by recent research in the U.S., particularly California, and that is that social media and user-to-user -user storytelling about electric vehicles has proven to be more meaningful than direct marketing. And so what I've highlighted here are a couple of examples of forums where telling stories about usage of electric vehicles has been uh, very positive and also places where users go to understand better where to gain information. What's really interesting, and, and I think the clip, uh, sorry, the quote here highlights this really well is, in the consumers I interviewed, being able to go on YouTube and watch videos of electric vehicles driving down snowy roads in Norway or uphill in the California Sierras helped convince them more to buy one than watching marketing or reading marketing materials from the manufacturer. So if you are going to participate in electric vehicles, doing so at a person-to-person -person level is actually very effective and it's not costly. And lastly, um, I suggest walking the talk. So if you're a business or a council or a state government that's interested in doing something on electric vehicles, the very best thing you can do is buy one. And if you're not prepared to buy 100 and put them in your fleet, then buy one. Just buy one and use it and pass it on to the next person in your business and fully appreciate what it means to, to drive one because there's no better way to understand how your experiences will inform the uniqueness of your business or your organization and where to integrate the EV in it. Um, and then, of course, you know, tweet about it and use your photos from your experiences, capture them and share them so that people can understand better. And in this particular instance, I have used myself as an example. Um, so we in our household have, have two electric vehicles. One is a pure battery electric vehicle. The second is a plug-in hybrid. My husband and I bought the first one in 2013, the Mitsubishi iMuse. I drive it daily. The second vehicle, a Mitsubishi Outlander, we bought in 2015. Um, we, we don't necessarily have a distinct preference for Mitsubishi. We ended up with these cars because they were available in the market and they suited our needs as, motor, as a household for motoring. Um, we have them both. We use the IMEs actually more than we use the Outlander. We tend to use that more for camping and weekends and long trips and that sort of thing, but they're both excellent vehicles. Um, and we also recharge at home using our three kilowatt solar system. In terms of daily driving experiences, I've just summarized a few of them here for you. So we do most of our charging at home on 240 volts, 15 amp plug. It's not a fancy charging setup by any means. It takes some time to charge the car, but we very rarely run it empty. And if we do, it's ready the next morning for us to keep driving. Um, the all-electric range on the PHEV, the, the car in the photo there, is 50 kilometers. So it actually suits us really well if we just want to use it around town. Um, and in future, we'll have the ability to extend the range of that vehicle with fast charging stations that are coming in through a number of brands, as noted. The battery electric car um, can use the fast charging infrastructure now, so we can actually take it on longer trips, something we weren't able to do before. So that's really excellent. Um, despite that, we only drive about 20 to 30 kilometers per day and spend about 70 cents on fuel um, per day, which I think is outstanding, not to mention there are certain instances where we can take advantage of free refueling and free parking, which are incentives offered by shopping malls like Westfield, which we have recently used. Um, we spend about $500 on servicing annually, and with an electric vehicle, at least the pure battery one that often involves um, rotating tires, 
uh, changing wiper blades and cleaning the car's interior. So very, very little at all. Um, and we do occasionally, or if we have in the past, occasionally used car hire before we got the plug-in electric car there that has the, uh, uh, the petrol option. Um, but that was very rare because we don't often take road trips to Sydney or somewhere as far um, as we would need to. So there is my personal experience about driving an EV daily and, and really enjoying it. And uh, that is all from me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elena. Really appreciate it, especially the insights into your personal experience. Um, we'll just move on now to some of the things that the CFC has done. Um, you know, the financing um, arm of the federal government, ultimately it's our role to catalyse finance into sectors and, and this is one of the things, one of the sectors which is a priority for us. So I thought it would be worth just covering off on three key areas. What, what we've seen in offshore markets that may provide a precedent to be considered in the Australian market. Uh, what the CFC has done itself in terms of supporting the EV market, so what financing have we actually deployed into the market and what our experience has been to some degree with those facilities, and what do we want to see happen from a financing perspective that we believe would support uh, the CFC's objective of increasing penetration of, into the EV market and supporting the financing for that transition. So maybe just covering off first on what we've seen in the global markets, uh, offshore activity for financing EVs in a sustainable format, in an identifiably, identifiably sustainable format, has been relatively modest compared to other consumer finance sectors. So rooftop solar, for instance, has been an extremely large market for financing and for financing that has been identified as green financing. Um, even you know, residential mortgages in Europe in particular have been uh, a, a pretty strong focus of the SRI investment um, community. EVs, everybody's aware of the transition and, and clearly in European markets in particular, uh, we've seen um, strong initiatives to support that transition, but financing markets have not focused on this sector as heavily. Um, yeah, perhaps that's because in the transport sector, global certification of green investments have been heavily focused around um, assets, particularly rail, because they tend to be focused on uh, emissions per kilometre per passenger, and those metrics clearly favour um, heavy transport such as rail and to, some, to a lesser extent um, buses. So light vehicles haven't really been a big focus of global SRI investors. There have, however, been some notable transactions um, that I think have, have shown a clear pathway to how financial markets can support this, transact, this transition. Um, the, perhaps the most obvious example has been a securitisation of auto leases originated by Tesla's captive finance business in the United States. That was completed earlier this year and I expect that will be the first of a number of transactions of those types where the market ultimately finances consumers to buy um, electric, fully electric vehicles. Toyota Financial Services have completed a couple of transactions which have been marketed as supporting transition to lower emission vehicles. Uh, that, they've been interesting transactions in that they haven't been financing of the low emission vehicles themselves, but rather they've been financing done by Toyota in its normal course of business, secured by consumer contracts against all types of vehicles, but the proceeds from that financing have been specifically peg pegged to uh, support origination of low emission vehicles and that's, those transactions both have been completed in the United States. The other transaction that, that's been of note in terms of the electric vehicle um, transition has been a, a, a deal done by Geely, which was a US $400 million green bond raising, which was not for the financing of acquisition of vehicles, but rather to finance the development and construction and manufacture of a fleet of electric vehicles for the London taxi market. So I'm sure you're all familiar, well I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, you know, the London Black Cab. Geely is the company which manufactures those vehicles. At the moment that fleet has relatively limited electric vehicle penetration, uh, but Geely have committed to transitioning that fleet to a fully electric fleet. 
so quite an interesting transaction to see uh, a manufacturer commit so strongly to a specific market. Moving on then to what the CFC has done to date, there's really been two limbs of it and the aggregation programs which we have in place for financing of the purchase of the vehicles is the first of those limbs. We've tried to cover a number of markets across low emission vehicles and, and we've sought to try and support electric vehicles specifically. We've completed transactions with Eclipse for operating lease financing. Uh, we have transactions focused on broker origination for SME style customers and also for bank programs uh, for customers who are looking to acquire um, eligible vehicles. We have a specific program in place with Macquarie Bank which has been very heavily focused around electric vehicles and that covers consumers as well as SME borrowers. And there's a number of other programs which we have in place aimed at retail channels, some of which are in the market now and some of which we expect to see um, further announced in the reasonably near future. So those have been relatively successful in supporting um, customer choice towards lower emission vehicles and the challenge has been in the context of what we've already heard about for um, you know, the rollout of EV, um, EV vehicles in Australia, how, how to best shape those transactions to support that even further. The other limb of what the CESC has done in the EV market has been to look at opportunities to lend directly to corporates and other manufacturers, participants in the market in various shapes and forms where it's not supporting the actual electric vehicles themselves but rather infrastructure that uh, will, will, will assist with that EV transition. So a couple of examples, we've provided a working capital facility to an electric truck manufacturer, C Electric. We have a venture capital facility uh, with Carbon Revolution um, whose business is manufacturing carbon fibre rims for vehicles but who are actively looking to support the EV market in their uh, growth objectives. We've also put a venture capital investment into Reelectrify who have uh, a business that's designed to support effectively the end life value for electric vehicles through finding appropriate repurposing of batteries from those electric vehicles which we see as being a very innovative technology and, and, and on a long term basis highly supportive of the EV market. We have a range of other businesses that finance assets in the built environment and wherever possible we work with partners both from an equity and debt perspective to encourage them to consider supportive infrastructure such as end of trip charging facilities. Those sorts of arrangements are generally done on a negotiated basis with our, um, you know, with our partners rather than being requirements imposed by us as a condition of our financing but we find that uh, it generally only requires a relatively small push for people to consider these options and realise that they can be strongly positive for their own business uh, in their own right. So taking all those factors into account, what are the things that we want to see from the market that we believe would support financing coming alongside to then in turn uh, support the transition of EVs into the market in Australia? Clearly we want to see increased commitment to the Australian market for OEMs and especially for mass market vehicles because to get significant penetration um, clearly the Australian market is relatively small and heavily skewed towards um, a, a relatively limited number of vehicle types and so mass market vehicles is really important and we would greatly appreciate continued commitment to the Australian market from OEMs. We obviously do a lot of work to try and encourage support from all levels of government around both monetary and non-monetary incentives for uptakes of EVs and Paul's given some um, guidance as to some of the sorts of things that can be considered for non-monetary incentives and we will continue to work and play our part in that as well. Um, clearly the role of governments across the board in terms of their own fleet buying activities is critical and we believe that that can be a strong signal to the market. Development of investor demand for the asset class and that's something that we actively work on on a day in day out basis to help finance become a pull factor in influencing consumers 
so, you know, the Nevada situation here is that ultimately you'll be able to get a better rate for financing an electric vehicle than you would be for financing an internal combustion engine vehicle. In order for that to happen, the broader capital markets and financing in Australia has to appreciate its role and has to agree to play a role in delivering that outcome. Uh, but we believe that in the medium term that's a reasonable aspiration and something that we're encouraging to try and happen. We obviously want to see continued reduction in the cost of batteries because it's critical in driving down the cost of new EVs to compare with internal combustion engine vehicles. And we're investing across a range of different parts of the economy to try and support that within the capacity which we have. So we've made investments in the lithium development market in Australia, in technology companies of the sort that we've previously identified, uh, and also in other enabling technology for batteries and, and EV charging as we've talked about already. So that's it as far as the formal presentation is concerned um, from, from the presenters and there's, there's obviously been a number of questions come through which we're keen to try and address and we'll work through those as far as possible just as a quick housekeeping order to the extent that we can't uh, address any of your questions on this call because we run out of time, um, please get in contact with us and we'll certainly work to try and address those questions with you directly but we'll, we'll, we'll push through as many as we can. Um, with that in mind, Paul, one of the questions that, that comes up often and has been asked again today um, with relation to EVs is the, the impact of significant increase of EVs on, on the electricity grid and, and what we think that will look like. Are you able to give a bit of colour on that? <clears throat> yeah, so there's actually quite a lot of variables at play as, as to how this uh, impact ends up <clears throat> eventuating in the in sort of the medium to long term. So some of those being is is it depends on the share of home charging versus uh, fast charging at public charge points. It'll depend on the share of uh, charges that are that are powered by rooftop solar or behind the meter solar, and also perhaps accompanied by behind the meter batteries. And so we know that there's some very aggressive forecasts of the deployment of these by sort of 2030 in the Australian market. And it also depends critically on how that EV charging is managed, whether it's uh, managed in a way to benefit or to minimise the impact on the grid or whether it's allowed to, or whether there's no um, charging management. And so NJ did some an analysis on this and they showed that EV charge management can avoid significant increase in the maximum demand. <clears throat> And, then, and that's because managed charging of, of level two charging, so that's what we'd class as the slow charges that a lot of people would use uh, at home or at, at the office. This will result in, in, if it's managed, it will result in significantly lower costs um, to and reduce peak demand and increase the minimum grid demand and also potentially could reduce ramp rates. So there's a very strong financial incentive for managed charging to eventuate, and then they they quantified NJ quantified this by they by looking at the total EV charging load, so both level two charges and fast charges, and overall they saw an increase due to EV charging on the on the electricity grid of 2.8 gigawatts of maximum demand by 2040. Thanks, Paul. That's interesting. So one one of the other questions that's come through is about the role of uh, government fleet in influencing uptake uh, and in particular the supply in the second hand market. It, it's, a, it's a great question. As I've mentioned briefly, I think all levels of government have a really significant role to potentially play. Um, government fleets you know, are often driven by procurement processes which are focused around lowest cost and that, that has been a barrier to increased penetration of EVs within government fleets. However, we do think that you know already, subject to, to availability of um, you know the vehicles of a suitable type for the relevant users, we do think that the case is already pretty compelling on life cycle costs for governments to actively push to increase penetration of EVs, if in, if if only on a trial basis. Uh, the other key aspect of that piece is clearly that public commitment of that nature supports OEM's decisions around importing models into the Australian market, which can have a virtuous circle effect in terms of then making them available for the broader consumer market. So that's only the most obvious 
impact clearly of um, government fleets supporting EVs. The other piece is that people tend to buy vehicles that they've used and have become comfortable with and people who've become comfortable with electric vehicles as a work vehicle um, will then likely be uh, more supportive of, of purchasing that type of vehicle for private use. And so we do see fleets, both government and non-government, for those non-government fleet operators who have a commitment to sustainability and the transition in a more broad sense, it's having a really important role to play. Yeah, I'd add to that actually, Richard. That's, uh, that is a great question and, and as you mentioned, Government fleet targets can address one of the three barriers that uh, NRJ identified being model availability, but it also, more cars on the road through government fleets increases the business case and the profitability for public charging networks to be built, so it indirectly addresses one of the other barriers. Um, and then one of the really important uh, inputs to fleet, private fleet buying decisions is the uh, resale value of vehicles. And so government fleets could have an important role in uh, building out a second-hand vehicle market in Australia and identifying uh, resale value. So government fleets could, could indirectly uh, facilitate more private fleet buying by um, increasing the number of second-hand vehicles available. And if we look at the example in New Zealand where um, they, the New Zealand government had, uh, has a policy in place where it, a government fleet has to justify why they would not buy the electric vehicle when there's an equivalent electric vehicle and com uh, internal combustion engine that would suit their needs. And New Zealand has a much more mature second-hand vehicle market than Australia does as a result, or partially as a result of that policy. Richard, can I just add something uh, on the fleet topic? Um, I mentioned this earlier in my presentation, but I think it's important to note that user experience within fleets is also very important for governments. Um, and what I mean by that is it's a very difficult business decision to switch your entire fleet from one type of fuel and operation pra operational practice to another one. So one adv advantage uh, uh, that electric vehicles offer fleet operators right now is being able to transition um, state in a phased or staged process. So I think it's worth considering adopting one or two or possibly even borrowing some electric vehicles in the short term because as you might know, um, the fleet sector often has set routes or some of the vehicle fleet has unplanned journeys and variables that aren't often considered are the user response to electric vehicles. People don't like to be forced to drive a different kind of car or spend a lot of time learning it. So um, normalizing that electric vehicle process for users in a staged manner can be very helpful. Um, and also then, of course, you can use that experience to draw attention and, and leverage marketing for the goodwill of the, um, the organization publicly. Thanks very much, Elena. I think that's a good point too. And, and coming back as well, um, you know, perhaps a question of mine um, to, to one of your pictures of the McDonald's uh, um, offering charging. I mean, maybe a question for Paul in terms of some of the views from Anna Jaya on this question about the best sites for um, you know for EV charging. And and you know, we we talked about the potential. Um, expansion of EV charging networks through private companies. Um, you know, one of the questions that comes up a lot are the best, as I said, the best places for EV charging stations. You know, just interested in your views on, you know, the comparison with current um, infrastructure around petrol stations versus other things which may be more suitable for EVs and, and, and your thoughts on that. Yeah, so uh, one, that was actually one of the key uh, points of the NRJ work that we asked them to look at. What, what is the um, competitive environment and what are the, the sort of the attributes or, or critical success factors that would lead a, a stakeholder or an organisation to be best placed to build these EV charging networks? And so they looked at how this has been rolled out internationally. There's actually a wide range of different actors that are rolling out and owning the EV, the public EV charging networks internationally. And so when they looked at the Australian market and who's best placed, they actually uh, concluded that there's a range of actors who are potentially equally best placed. So there's, there's unlikely to be, well in Australia it seems that there's no one clear winner of who is the best place to own these uh, EV charging networks. So 
Um, amongst the, the group of actors who could potentially own these is current petrol station operators because obviously they have um, locations along major uh, transport routes. Um, there could also be automotive organ associations, so we've seen already the NRMA rolling out a, a charging network. Uh, in countries internationally, um, EV charges have been rolled into the regulated asset base of electricity networks. And then there's also energy retailers in Australia are also in potentially a strong position to, de to deploy those um, charging infrastructure. And, and the non-financial measures that can support, you know, because everybody's always looking for, for non-financial measures um, for obvious reasons, you know, the non-financial measures, you know, that can drive more EVs, you know, again, interested in, in NRJ's findings on the overseas experience on that and, and, and how effective, you know, what are they and how effective they are? Yeah, so when, when people talk about the non-financial non uh, incentives, they're thinking about things like uh, access to transport lanes and bus lanes, um, free charging around town, free parking or preferential parking. Um, and so those have been important barriers internationally, but not the most um, powerful barrier. So when, when they look at the financial versus non-financial trade-offs, and, and there's actually a, a very interesting study out in Norway that showed the ranking of the different incentives and how likely it was that that incentive would lead to the purchase decision of an EV. And they, they saw that the financial uh, incentives are still the most powerful, but access to those types of um, non-financial incentives are, are important barriers, and those, importantly, are some of the barriers that are available to local governments around Australia. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, Alina, a question perhaps for you um, from, from one of the people online. Um, there's a question about you know, whether, speaker, whether any of us have, have identified use cases where EVs are cheaper to own or run than an equivalent internal combustion engine, and, and I know, and, and what parameters you know, will affect that trajectory. I think we've probably covered the second part to some degree, but I was interested, you know, given the work you've done yourself around your own personal use patterns and, and the research you've done, whether or not you, you thought there were, you know, clearly identifiable typical scenarios where an electric vehicle would, would be cheaper to run? Yeah, look, I'm happy to take, a, take that one on. Look, in the first instance, an electric vehicle is most often more cost effective to operate than a petrol vehicle and that is largely driven by the price of petrol or diesel versus the price of accessing electricity even if it's renewably generated electricity. So when you compare the usage of fuel from that perspective, the EV always wins. Um, where there is a difficulty around cost is around the purchase price of the product. And what we've seen um, from the modeling done by Energea is that the purchase price of electric vehicles is in a steady decline, along with the cost of storing electricity in batteries. Um, so we have good reason to believe that very soon the cost trajectory for electric vehicles will be consistent with petrol vehicles, as has been represented. But where I'd like to just make a point is that the everyday consumer struggles with the concept of using a calculation of total cost of ownership, but really it's the best one to factor in to your consideration when you think about buying an electric vehicle. So, or any vehicle for that matter, um, often consumers don't consider the aggregate cost of owning and operating a car over its life cycle when they make a decision to buy one. They look at the sticker price and what they can currently afford. And I would actually suggest that the CEFC might have a role to play in helping consumers think about total cost of ownership, particularly as they make lending available to them at a lower cost rate. Because if you're able to provide that finance at a discount um, relative to a petrol product, then it might be easier for consumers to think about the lifetime of the car and how they'll use it. And I'll just add one more point. Batteries and the uh, OEMs have considered batteries in their warranties now going forward such that the lifetime, the estimated warranted lifetime of the battery is expected to last for most of the vehicle's life, so usually around eight years. That's a considerable change from the first generation of EVs, so it really does shift thinking in terms of how long you might own and operate and drive this car comfortably. And in terms of our little IMEV, which is a first generation EV and, and not by any stretch the best car on the market, um, we've seen very little change in our 
electric range, and I think we've calculated roughly 5 to 7% battery degradation. So if you look after your car like any car, the battery will, uh, will last and work just fine. Thanks very much, Elena, and I think it's a great suggestion about, um, you know, providing tools for people to do comparisons. You know, it's always, um, you know, death by assumption in those calculations, but I, I think it, it would be a really useful tool. Um, you know, with all of that in mind, I mean, Paul, maybe um, to, as we get towards the end of the time available, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, uh, you know, just, a, you know, Australian forecast increases, you know, based on, you know, sales for EV uptake. Yeah, so I, I finished my section with that graph of global sales and the re, and constant revisions over the last couple of years. And, and when we look at the same thing amongst the publicly available Australian EV forecasts, we see similar trends. So um, we've, we've looked at the our latest, the, the Energia forecast, but also if you look at the very recent uh, AMO's integrated system plan, um, there's also AMO's electricity statement of opportunities from 2017 and CSIRO low emission technology roadmap. And if you, each of those uh, reports does uh, several scenarios, and and when you sort of compare the comparable scenarios across those different reports in the last two to three years, you see the same trend as what we saw in the global slide, which is that. Um, the the latest and most up-to-date forecasts show earlier and more rapid uh, uptake of EVs. So so similar situation in Australia is what we're seeing globally. Great, thanks Paul. So we had a couple of questions from people who, who are looking at that from a local government perspective and, and what information there is in terms of case studies or examples um, that they can use to inform themselves and, and perhaps support their own cases. Um, th there are examples for that kind of thing that we've got done um, uh, we've done case studies on based on our activity to date and, and we'd be happy to share those um, afterwards with, with parties who are interested. Um, as we're getting towards the end of the time, I might um, sort of wrap it up in terms of questions there, but just to note, um, for, for anybody on the call that has questions we haven't had a chance to get to and there's, there's a number there, um, we really would be, be very happy to take further questions offline and to come back and continue that dialogue and share the information that we have uh, and where we don't have information ourselves, try and make suggestions as to sources of information that people can refer to um, for, their, for the answers to their questions. Um, just to close off then, um, I'd like to thank you all for participating in the webinar and, and for listening in. We really appreciate the chance to try and communicate some of the work we've done. Um, it's a key objective of the CFC. Uh, to try and share information and, and this sort of thing is a, is a big part of it, so thank you again. I'd like to thank Elena and Paul for their, their time and uh, insight, which has been fantastic, um, you know, and particularly the personal insights from Elena about her own uh, EV usage. Um, as I mentioned, you'll get directed to a quick survey, and, but uh, one of the other questions that came in from a couple of people um, was whether or not they would get a copy of the slide, so just to reconfirm, uh, everybody who's registered on the uh, webinar will get emailed a copy of these slides uh, and as we said, any questions please do follow up with us. So thanks again and uh, we hope to hear from all of you soon.